Okay, my name is Andrew Georgiadis. I'm with the firm Dover Cole and Partners, and I'm joined by Maria Mercer from Duani Platter Zyberg and Company, and Eduardo Castillo of Castillo Arquitectos. And a few things that that I need to uh, tell you regarding the uh, credits. So the session has been improved for uh, 1.25 AIA and 1.25 AICP continuing education credits. And for AIA, uh, please uh, sign in at the back of the room for your credits and uh, write your names and your AIA numbers clearly so that you can be awarded them. And for AICP, uh, please report your attendance online at planning.org uh, uh, slash CM. And the event number is number 19209 in case uh, you need to register the event uh, session for your AICP credits. <coughs> So thank you for attending our session. We know that we're competing against some really amazing speakers, so we're really flattered that we have this group here that's really dedicated to the idea of, of, uh, of Latin American urbanism and, and that, you would, that you'd come to attend our session. The title of the, uh, of the session is Two Planning Traditions of Colonial Latin America, the Hispanic and the Luso-Brazilian Townscapes. As you all know what Hispanic means, but just in case there's anybody in the room, when we say Luso, that's um, a term that means Portuguese. As, as you know, uh, in Portugal, is also called uh, Lusitani, uh, Lusitania. Lusitana. And a, a person from there is a Lusitano. And so it's a shorthand for that country's name. So the Luso-Brazilian is, is the Portuguese, and then the Hispanic is that which derives from Spain and its colonies. So the topics that we're going to be examining today are First, a, a very brief history of, of how the two planning traditions emerged in the colonial era, and starting with the, the, the famous treaty, which we'll talk about soon, and then look at some of the outstanding historic examples that are the, the places that are of great instructional value to us as urbanists. Then we're going to compare and contrast the two traditions, looking at different scales, starting from the siding of the building, uh, I'm sorry, siding of the town. Thank you, Eduardo. That's why he's here. He's to, here to keep me um, uh, correct here. Then the urban structure, the block in the public realm, building type, and finally finishing off with the architectural detail. And then we're going to look at the living traditions and see how some of these two uh, colonial heritage, parallel heritages, have helped to inform the practice of, of new urbanists in the region today. So. Um, and then, of course, we'll have questions and answers afterwards. So please, Canadians, don't be offended. C Canada's not here because today we're going to talk about everything uh, uh, in Latin America. And yes, we put the United States here because we really feel that because of our colonial history and because of, uh, of being in a place like uh, South Florida that we should be considered part of this, this tradition. And. <clears throat> In uh, approximately 1494, the, the papacy was already seeing the dilemma that would soon arise in the New World as, as the Iberian Peninsula was looking westward and starting to colonize this vast new landscape. How would these lands be, be divided? Now, I am not a scholar on the Treaty of Tordesillas, but there are people that have devoted their entire lives to discussing the minutia of how this actually was determined. Some think that the Pope may have been uh, aware of the big Europe-sized bulge that was east of that line, which would later become Brazil. And some think that maybe he wasn't. And there's also the question of fairness. You know, Portugal had already uh, established extensive spice routes through the, uh, Africa and all the way to Asia, whereas Spain was, of course, concentrating more on, on the Americas. So the Treaty of Tord Tordesillas, or, or in Portuguese, Tordesillas, be, came to be negotiated and then subsequently moved slightly over the years, ever further westward. So this is the first line, but the actual final resting place is slightly west of the, of the line that you see right now. And why is that so important? Well, that line and eventually the modern-day borders of Brazil really became the distinct break where two, not only two country, uh, excuse me, two language patterns uh, were established in the New World, but it also became the break of where two distinct urban traditions occurred. And they vary, as we had talked about, in, in, in many different aspects. So the Red Stars 
are those which were patterned after the law of the Indies. And so Eduardo will say everything in Spanish today. So, <laughs> and, and you can correct me if I say it wrong, but le, Leyes de Indias, which, Las Leyes de Indias Españolas. And those would be all of the red stars. And so even in the United States, of course, we have several notable examples. Uh, for those of you who may not be able to see, um, we have in Florida and New Mexico, California, um, and we have several places where those towns uh, were established. And then, for, and also forgive me, those of you from the other countries, we didn't mean to leave them out. There are so many good examples in every single country of excellent Law of the Indies era towns. And uh, we just put a few of the notable examples uh, that we could think of here. And then the blue stars are the ones in, in, in the uh, Portugal's great colony, which was Brazil. And so um, there you can see more or less on both sides of the line of the Treaty of Tordesillas the two different urban uh, traditions. And so I just wanted to flash this up to you, uh, flash this before you, because uh, for, for you language bl uh, buffs, uh, there's a grammar that we speak when we're communicating in a foreign language. And there are several different inflections, some of them subtle, some of them not so subtle that help us uh, distinguish between meaning and, and distinguish between the languages. And just like in, in linguistics, we also see that architecture and urbanism has similar inflections. So the same element is manifested in different ways depending on its cultural context. So, Eduardo, please join me. We're going to do something a little bit different than is common at CNU. Rather than uh, uh, have divided topics, we're going to have a more free-flowing thing where we have a dialogue and a, and a conversation about each element. So I'm going to describe uh, one part of this, the slide, and Eduardo will we'll look at the other half. So looking at the largest scale, the siding of the towns, how were the two towns uh, sided? Just a, a, a brief introduction about what we are actually going to compare it. We are using two of the best uh, colonial examples uh, to display the differences or similarities between the two, uh, the two traditions. Um, and on the left, um, and this is something that we are going to have in each image, on the left we are going to have Antigua, Guatemala. Uh, which is a town that was the capital of uh, Guatemala, uh, Guatemala uh, so actually called Santiago de los Caballeros. Well, it was the capital of Guatemala from uh, the 1500s up to the late 1700s uh, until it was destroyed by earthquakes and other natural disasters. And on the right, we have Oro Preto in Brazil, in Minas Gerais. Um, and, and the siding, um, when, when, when we look at the traditional uh, Law, law of the Indies towns. The law of the Indies, I'm, I'm also, again, not a scholar on the law of the Indies, um, but the law of the Indies uh, is the treaty that came down from Spain by, uh, by uh, from Philip II, the king of Spain, um, which basically laid out the laws or the code for the new settlement in the new world. Um, and usually, uh, like is the case here in Antigua, um, the Spanish looked for to settle in places um, that are nestled in valleys between mountains or volcanoes with probably running water close to it, uh, rivers or lakes. Uh, but it, you very hardly see uh, one of these law of the Indies towns, for example, to be settled on the top of a hill or, or a ridge. Um, it's usually in a valley. Um, and hardly you ever see something next to a coast. Um, when uh, and on Oro Preto is a different case. In, co in contrast, the Brazilian townscape, the Luso Brazilian or the Portuguese uh, colonists, often located upon the severe slope and upon ridge lines, which um, uh, at first uh, seems to be uh, seems to lead to an urbanism that's more akin to its European uh, precedents, such as the the European hill town that one finds throughout the Mediterranean and on the Iberian Peninsula. One other thing that we had to mention about the law of the Indies is that the Spaniards had a written document. They had, they had a, a conscientious means and, uh, and, and a consistent way of colonizing the New World through, through these declarations, which later became known as, as the law of the Indies. However, the, the 
the, there's no evidence that the Portuguese approached urbanization with the same sort of, of consistency. The strange thing is, is though that the result is highly cons consistent and coherent within Brazil, but there was yet there was no uh, similar um, uh, declaration as to the appropriate siting of towns and the design of the public spaces. So that's one very interesting difference, the lack of a guiding document in Brazil versus the guiding document in the Spanish colonies. Okay. Then urban structure. And as you can see from this aerial image of uh, Antigua, Guatemala, um, this is one of the biggest differences between the two approaches also. Uh, when the Spanish took to the grid for the, the structure, the, the, for laying out new towns, uh, the, the, the Portuguese um, worked very differently with, with the topography. And on, in Antigua, Guatemala, you can see a, a system of blocks that were more or less 90 by 90 meters. Um, and this also informed the size and the shape of the public spaces. And also, when you look into a block, it also informed the size of the lots and the shape of the buildings themselves. So you have grids but within grids within grids, basically. It's very orthogonal and very different when you compare it to... We had a question. Yes, sorry. Well, it varies from town to town, but... Um, what you see is usually about 10 to 12 meters. And also, sitting to your right is Jean-François Lejeune, who's one of the preeminent scholars on law of the Indie settlements. Okay. And so he actually has been our teacher in numerous cases, and he could probably answer some of those questions as well. The uh, one other thing to notice about Antigua is just like every other law of the Indies town, notice that the central block is removed and that becomes the square. And so that has a different name in every country. It's the Parque Central in Guatemala, but it also is the Zócalo in, in Mexican towns or it is the, the Plaza in others. Right. So. And just about the size of the town, this town, the, the five minute walk that we use in the urbanist planning Antigua, the original grid, is basically made out of f four of those walking circles. Um, I don't know if it's coincidence or what, but it's just, it, it fits perfectly, you know, the, the five minute walk within the main core of the town. Later on in the discussion, as we talk about building type, I also want you to look at this aerial to see the uh, perfectly uh, square uh, uh, patio houses, which are a direct descendant, of course, from Andalusia but how, how um, that is only possible to this extent because of the orthogonal grid in the law of the Indies towns. So we'll see that a little bit later also. So then here in, at the same exact scale is Oro Preto in, in the state of Minas Gerais. And so um, Minas Gerais, which is the state, means general mines. And that state has so, so many different mines. This one is particularly a, a gold mining town, but others were diamond mining, like Giamanchina, which the name reflects that. And, and each town had its own special ore that was mined there. And so the miners had to establish upon a difficult to to topography. They had not the luxury of looking for uh, an easy plane to establish the town. And so you see that there's almost a torturous way that the streets are sinuous and, and run the, the, uh, uh, the tops of the ridges. And um, you almost can't find a straight line in the town. Here are the two towns at the same scale side by side, so you can see the, how the, differ, the differences in, in uh, both shapes of the public spaces and size of blocks and the geometry of the streets. So zooming in now into uh, at the level of the block in the public realm. The image on the left uh, is um, one of Antigua's main streets. Um, and you can see that it's a very unified streetscape. Um, most of the streets in this town are very linear. Um, you hardly see a terminated vista or a deflected vista also. Um, and there's a regularity also in the composition of the facades and of the building heights and materials. Um, the, the interesting thing, and, it, and this town still works like that, because you have such a uniform public realm. You can have uh, the house of a millionaire next to a very humble house, 
but everything works well within the same block and you don't see that competition between one or the other. Uh, um, the detail is actually on the inside of the houses and we're going to see that later on also. So it's uh, very democratic if you want to call it like that. Uh, now another thing about the law of the Indies is that uh, they call for very secure building types um, because you know they were colonizing a new place and, and they were trying to uh, uh, they come to places where, where there's a lot, a, a huge indigenous population as well. So they created a, for everyone these quarter types that are very, you know, they're very solid on the outside, but on the inside they are very private and porous and, and are good for the climate as well. So the building itself was the defensible. They didn't uh, use uh, walls for cities. Uh, it was the buildings themselves that were secure. And in contrast, uh, on the Brazilian side, notice that um, the deflection in the street wall, the, the subtle curve, so that the, the, the facades then always are tipped in view at the end of the street. And so that's something that is a unique, it's, it's very unique to, to the Brazilian cities. Now, of course, there are exceptions, and there are Hispanic towns that have deflections, and there are Brazilian, street, Brazilian cities with straight streets. So we're just looking right now at, at a, a, just a, what, is, what are the common patterns in, in both colonial spheres? And also notice the, the difference in the tendency of the, the spatial enclosure to be slightly more vertical in, in the Brazilian townscapes we've noticed uh, tend to have a, slight, a slightly higher proportion of height to width in, in the streetscape as well. Now we're going to look at the, the central square. Yeah, the, the central square of Antigua or Emala is actually um, it's called a central park. It's not called a plaza. Um, it, it used to be a plaza, but probably during the City Beautiful movement, it was turned into a park and it became more green as well. And this is the main public space in this city. And it's also the largest. Um, and it's surrounded by the main public buildings. That's one of the biggest differences probably between the two, the two traditions is that the, the Spanish uh, would place the, mo the most important buildings, also the most ornate ones and, and probably the tallest ones too, next to the main plaza. And you can see this all the way from California down to, down to Guatemala and, and other places in Central America. Uh, you usually have the, the church to the east, uh, the cathedral in this case, and you have the, the palace of government and the palace of commerce next to it uh, or side by side. Um, and City Hall, where, well, now, now it's City Hall. It used to be the, 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 main, the governor's seat for, for the entire uh, area of Central America. Um, but you don't see any residential types next to the main plaza. Notice also whether you're in Santa Fe or Antigua or in uh, Villa de Leyva in, in, in Colombia, that, that the common feature is the, the wooden arcade around, or the wooden colonnade around the, 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 uh, the Hispanic square. In main buildings, you would also have a masonry colonnade. Uh, probably yes. the, the more uh, commercial buildings had the, the, the wooden colonnade, and it's usually one story and the main buildings have a two-story colonnade made out of masonry. As is the case on the opposite side even of this photo, which exactly. is not visible here. Even, even when you look down this way, sorry, over here, it transitioned into a more important building, but it's the same path, the same uh, sidewalk, if you want to call it that. So uh, the, the arcade or the colonnade as a frontage type is r relatively rare in colonial Brazilian architecture. Rather, the, the facades tend to, to put their more smooth side uh, to, to the square. And also the proportions of the squares tend to be more elongated, generally in the one to three or one to four proportion like this, rather than the perfect square of, of, of the Spanish town. And as Eduardo had mentioned, uh, generally there's no dominant cathedral in a Brazilian town as there would be in, in a, a, a Spanish town. Generally the Spanish towns will have the large dominant cathedral and then the smaller parish churches in, in the, that organize the different wards of the town. Whereas in, in Brazil there would uh, be generally fewer uh, uh, churches of the same size distributed on the various hilltops of, of the towns. And that's true in Olinda and in Oro Preto and in really all the 
places um, um, that it occurs. There's another type of um, public uh, space uh, that, that you see in, in Antigua, Guatemala, and law, law of the Indies towns, is that the, the public spaces are related to a church. Uh, churches were usually the center of a neighborhood, uh, or parroquias, um, um, parishes, basically. Um, they, they, they were usually associated with a public space similar to this one that basically sets back the, the facade of the, of the, of the church and creates this void and this public space in between the street and the, and the facade of the, of the church. And this became an extension of the realm of the church itself. Um, and, and you can see it in many churches. Um, you don't see it in, for other building types, perhaps. It's usually related to a church. And that becomes the center of a neighborhood, more or less. And just as it's rare to have the perfectly square central square in, in a Brazilian town, also the secondary squares are also highly irregular and, and really based upon topography. And they're generally, uh, there are, there are uh, church, um, let's say, uh, squares that are anchored by a church in Brazil, of course, but many of them also have a more secular commercial aspect to them, as you see a lot of shop fronts and, and also the non-parallel street walls that are really just a widened part of, of, of a street rather than, than a, square, a square that has the shape of a square. The location of um, elements like fountains or sculptures is usually reserved also for the center of the plaza. As you see in the image of Antigua Guatemala, this is in the main plaza, uh, in the main square. And you can see that the, 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 the fountain itself, although it's not colonial, it came a few years later, uh, it's sitting right there at the center um, in contrast to what you see in the Oro Preto that's part of a wall, basically. Um, the fountain in, here, in this case, in, in Guatemala, um, I, I don't believe that's the, the original one, um, but, but it, it holds the center. and. You see it in, in, in the other squares, maybe it's off to the side, but it's always standing alone. It's not a part of a building. The fountain is always standing by itself. So fountain as, as uh, art to be appreciated in the round versus fountain as street wall. Now we're going to shift um, even uh, to, to, to the next scale, which is building type. And Antigua Guatemala uh, relies heavily on the use of the courtyard building type. Um, most of these buildings were single family houses originally, um, and they were mo mostly residential probably. The, the thing about courtyard buildings is that uh, there, are this, there are such flexible types that this city has been able to evolve over time accommodating other uses while still keeping the same uh, building type and keeping the same facades. Uh, what you can see in this image is uh, a series of houses, although one could, the, the, the blue one could be a store and the owners of that store can actually leave behind it. Uh, the other one can be just a, a house, but they're sitting on the same block. Um, and you see that the walls, uh, the, the proportion of the, the ratio of wall to opening, uh, it's, it's uh, it's, it's more massive, you know, there's more wall, wall than there are openings. Um, there's a few openings and these rooms usually are very narrow and lead off to a courtyard at the center, behind, uh, at the center of the building, like this one down here. Um, so you can see that the facade is very austere. Very few details, uh, lintels, the uh, um, sills in, in the windows, uh, the portico uh, around the Sawan, which is the entrance to the garage now, but it used to be the carriage house, uh, the carriage entrance. Uh, and then on the, on, the, on the interior, you have this very lush uh, landscaping, uh, usually with a fountain in the middle, surrounded by a column, by an arcade, one or two stories, and all these uh, elaborate details uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the masonry, in the, in the carpentry, and also the metalwork. 
And in the Brazilian case, although there are sometimes patios in, 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 in central courtyards, in buildings such as monasteries and more significant buildings, it's rather rare in the urban fabric. So the day-to-day -day building type is generally not a courtyard, but rather simply an attached row house, whether it be one or two stories. So that's a key difference between the two traditions. And I know I said I was going to talk about this at the end, but I think this is a good place to look at the, um, uh, the well, we're going to talk about windows now or a little bit later? You can, you can do it. Okay. And I, I need to go back to make another point. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> so just we're, we'll talk about it a little bit later, but I wanted you to notice on the left in the Guatemalan uh, uh, example that the window has a very strong sill with brackets. And notice that in the Brazilian example, there's generally not a window sill, especially one that, not that does not project from the wall plane. And however, there is always a sense of a strong lintel in the, in the Portuguese-Brazilian uh, window. And also notice that the, the Hispanic uh, towns tend to use more often the casement window that opens like this, whereas the Portuguese one tends to have the double-hung window that opens like this, so it slides up and down. So uh, once again, there are exceptions, and there are places where one has the other's uh, a preferred window type, but this is just a generalization of, of what is more common. An additional thing about the building type in, a, in Antigua or Guatemala is that um, when, you, when you analyze an aerial view or a plan of Antigua or Guatemala, you can see that many blocks of the city were probably originally composed out of four lots, four big lots, and, but through time they have been subdivided. And the type, the building type, allows for that to happen. Um, and you can see it, maybe we don't have a picture of this, but sometimes you see a street that you can tell that it used to be the same building, and probably the owner of that building uh, passed away and left the building to, to, to their, their sons and others, and you can see where they subdivided uh, through time, and they, they use, you, then people start painting them different colors. But the facade still works, even though they have different owners and probably even different uses. It's easy to subdivide the building type into smaller increments also. So now into the architectural details. So looking at, looking at the churches, maybe Eduardo, you could... Yeah, maybe this is not the best example of a church in Antigua Guatemala. Uh, it, it, it's probably, there are more detailed, uh, and you're going to see it in the next image. But what we want to discuss here is the building facade composition. And usually churches in Antigua Guatemala were composed of three uh, vertical uh, elements. And you can see the entrance in the middle and the two towers. Um, sometimes you would have a, um, a very ornate facade as well, especially in the Baroque era churches, and a, and a dome behind it, or several domes and vaults. And, and notice also that it's m more embedded in the urban fabric than, than its neighbor on the right. Uh, and in contrast, the, the, the Brazilian example often has uh, uh, elements such as gables, and pediments and entablatures, which would be difficult to find in, uh, on, in the Hispanic example. We showed these two churches just because they, were both, they both had a similar composition of the two towers, but we, uh, we thought that the other, that, that, that what makes them uh, distinguish from each other is, becomes evident when we look at them. And on, on this image, you can see actually how Again, how public space gets created when you carve out or, or you do a setback from the, the, the facade of the buildings and you create this small public space in be between the street and, and the facade. This is a very ornate facade, Baroque facade. And there's a few examples of churches like this in Antigua Guatemala. The color yellow is very present and, uh, and, and, and the white to contrast with the moldings and details also. Um, but you can see the same, basically it's the same I see as the, as the, as the, as the church that we showed before, you know, the three, um, the three vertical um, divisions uh, in, in, the, in the facade, and you can see it both in the big, uh, in, in the larger facade and also the smaller. When looking at the high Baroque as, they man, as it manifested itself in both the Hispanic and, and the Portuguese speaking colonies, we see that, that the Baroque architecture, as Eduardo had mentioned, um, generally affects the facade, but not the plan as much. So um, right. absent from the Hispanic towns are, are churches with oval plans or ellipses. So um, 
as, as, as opposed to the Brazilian example where you often will see the ovals or the ellipses that were directly related to what was happening in continental Europe at that time with the, uh, with the work of Bernini and Borromini, which actually had the Baroque that influenced more spatially the plan of the church rather than just the ornament. So that's another uh, a large difference between the two. Um, in Antigua Guatemala and many other um, Spanish examples, you see the domes on, on top of churches and vaults as well. And they were built out of masonry. Um, and and they, were, they were, you know, structural also. Um, that's why you can see some of these cracking. And since this city was partially destroyed by an earthquake, this is one of the few domes that are still standing in this city. And in Brazil, um, masonry vaulting was also relatively rare. Rather, the, the basilicas were built as, as, as sheds with wood trust roofs like this. And so you would generally not have a large cupola that dominated the, uh, pro, the, the, the skyline of the town, but rather smaller towers, usually in pairs, that would be at the, pulled forward at the front of the building rather than at the center of the transept as would be the case in Spain. So an interesting thing is that in some cases the, the Hispanic tradition was following more closely the Iberian Peninsula, but in other cases the Brazilian was in, in different aspects. So, oh, This is a fun image. Um, this is a, a corner window. Um, there's, this is are very common in Antigua, Guatemala, especially in um, houses that had very wealthy <laughs> owners. Um, the, the corner window uh, is usually in the, in the main living room, and it was used to, uh, this is where the, the, a young person would come to court the lady of the house, basically. So it's built in a way that the person on the street is, can be sitting on a horse and talking to the lady that's sitting next to a chaperone inside of the building. They, they usually, in, on the inside, they would have a, a built-in uh, bench as well, and, and you can see also the elaborate uh, sill, um, no lintel, and, and also the, 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 the masonry column that's supporting the corner. Um, and you see this also in commercial buildings where you would have very permeable corners. Um, when, when, you, when you look at the, at, the, at the Brazilian example, it's more solid as well. The, this is an example that occurs in different places of the city. Right. Yeah, as Eduardo was, was mentioning, the, the corner column is generally more emphasized, and it's very rare to see um, more of the ethereal corner that you would see in Antigua, which is amazing, amazingly ahead of its time. It almost prefigures some of the, the, the corner condition that you see in, 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 in the 20th century in modernism, where you, where you make the, that, that corner less solid and, and more transparent. Do you want to talk about the Brazilian one? No? Not the, okay. Sure. Oh, okay. This one, yeah. um, and the way that the, the walls meet the roof, it also varies a lot from one, and the roof itself varies a little bit from one culture to the other one. Um, in, in Antigua, you have mostly hip roofs and um, barrel tile. Um, and they're mostly at the same inclination, uh, percentage of inclination is usually 30%. And you have exposed rafters that, uh, you know, extend out into the public realm. Sometimes you have moldings, but the mo this is probably the most traditional way. And also the, uh, you, you, you see it in, in, in more humble houses as well. When you have a, a more elaborate house, you probably have a molding associated to it. But this is more, norm, more regular, the, the most regular case, probably. And in colonial Brazilian towns, though some buildings do have exposed rafter tabs, it's more often uh, uh, the roof is, is resting upon a very thick cornice. And the cornice is generally painted the same color as the corner column that we had showed earlier. So if you see, you see the blue, which sort of becomes a frame for the whole facade composition. One thing Eduardo had mentioned that the hip roof in the Hispanic town is very straight as it comes to the corner. And notice that in, it, uh, in, in the Brazilian example that there's a slight concavity to the roof profile that gives it an almost oriental appearance, which then finally has the upturned tile at the end. 
So um, that's something that's very distinctive, and, and it's hard to find really outside, outside of Brazil. And yeah, and also on architecture, not every single building needs to be one story in Antigua, Guatemala. Although in Antigua, Guatemala, you have a tradition of one-story buildings mostly because of earthquakes and very thick walls and thick columns as well. Um, but some of the main buildings around or close to the main plaza are actually two stories. And there's a, only a few examples of that remaining in Antigua, Guatemala, and they don't let you build like that anymore. Um, and, and in Brazil, the... Um this group of, of row houses of a similar scale to the one in Antigua shows also the uh, common way that, that they, they, they proposed balconies. And generally, if you go to Spain, you'll see that Spanish cities, one of the, the, the national patterns in Spain is that the balconies are very often uh, restricted to just that one fenestration so that the balcony serves that one door and not the, the whole width of the facade. And you'll see that in Madrid, and you'll see that in, in the south, and you'll see that in the north, really. The, 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 a building has uh, 20 windows, and it has 20 balconies. Whereas in Brazil, the colonials would generally uh, join a whole floor with one single balcony uh, uh, together, join those windows together. And notice also the painting. Though there, uh, there are places in Brazil which do do this, it is more often that the buildings are left a very mute color, uh, sometimes white, and then the trim becomes the place where the paint gets, gets more daring. So the trim, you'll see different color trim uh, distinguishing the different buildings, whereas in many of the Hispanic towns, the body color of the building gets the, its own color rather than just yeah. the trim. And it varies from town to town, and in, in Mexico you will, will have brighter colors in many towns, probably. Antigua itself has, uh, is more in the ochres and reds, and it, it has a color palette of about eight to ten colors that you can still use. And it's usually reserved for the body of the building. <laughs> And so um, those traditions are still alive in, in the, the region that we just d discussed. So um, here we have uh, uh, Duane Platter's Eiberg examples here. These are many of the, the different towns which that they've planned um, on both sides of the line of the Treaty of Tordesillas. They've, they've been practicing both in Brazil and in, and in Hispanic uh, America. And then Eduardo Castillo, along with Dover Cole and Partners, occasionally has uh, had the privilege of working extensively throughout the Central American countries, oftentimes informed by, by the urbanistic and architectural patterns of the Law of the Indies tradition. Yeah, we just want to throw this in very quickly, uh, because when we look at all these uh, traditional examples, we sometimes as um, from the outside, especially if we're not in Latin America, we forget that, it, that those traditions have long been forgotten, especially by, uh, you know, with the current uh, types of development. And when you look at the image on the left, it, it could be anywhere in the U.S., but it's very similar to the one on the right, although the sizes might be different. You still have the same separation of uses. Everything connects to the same uh, street. Uh, so this is something that we need to acknowledge, and when you open a real estate magazine nowadays, this is what you get. You get mostly houses with a two-car garage, and this is very different from the traditional towns. Um, so what we've been doing, uh, I mean, um, the three firms have been trying to reintroduce the idea of traditional town planning and really studying the DNA of these places in order to come up with towns, uh, buildings, neighborhoods that are relevant today, uh, but you know, are, that come from these traditions. Uh, this is a project outside Antigua, Guatemala, uh, not built, but it follows the same pattern of the grid and of the law of the Indies, the block sizes, but introduces things like alleys and parking in the rear and different building types based on the courtyard. Um, but when you look at the town from the distance, it's the same type of siding, the same type of urban pattern. And on the street level, you have the siding of the churches that uh, set back to create the, the public, uh, public realm. Um, 
the, pretty much the components of the architecture that we described. And this informs us for creating new towns, but also for creating extensions of existing towns and working in a historical context, uh, extracting the DNA of the place uh, and creating new opportunities for development uh, that are actually integrated into the urban fabric. Most of the, the development right now around this historical city is, even though they use the historical style, it's behind closed walls in, in a gated community. So we're trying to reintroduce the idea of actually extending the town or creating new towns that, are actually, uh, that come from the tradition. As you can see in this picture of this place that could be, and actually we, we've done some work on this street already, and instead of creating this huge master plan, we've begun doing smaller, um, smaller buildings that are changing the face of this neighborhood. Um, this, is, um, this, is, this is designed by Joe Cole, and, and it, it creates a very elaborate uh, study of building types in order to use it for a new building type, with building details as well, and building materials, and integrating a, a, a new building to a, to a historic church uh, and to a, to a historical setting. This is the, the ruins of a church that are next to this house. Um, you know, learning from the best examples in town and creating it with, you know, local crafts people that know, that still, that pretty much have kept these traditions alive. They know how to build this. Um, they can. <laughs> and this is another, uh, these are three houses. Um, like half a block down from that house, uh, instead of doing a gated project, we subdivided the land as it's supposed to be in a traditional city uh, with different lot sizes and lot types and accommodated the building, the, the courtyard building type to fit each lot individually. Um, so these are fee simple lots that can be sold off, you know, and a person can, can own a part of the historical city without being part of a condominium association or anything like that. And another thing that we, we, we tried to do is actually in, investigate these building types and, and these building traditions and come up with new types um, that are based on that. Um, this goes a little bit outside the, the tradition of, of the colonial city, but we're trying to reintroduce the idea of growing complete towns. And so we do hands-on sessions and we do public participation and codes for towns that are actually already grown up and that started probably as a law of the Indies town but has become, have become very different when they've grown up. Uh, so we're trying to extract the DNA also of these places and create these reg uh, new form-based codes um, and regulating plans for these towns to promote a different type of, of development and also doing suburban retrofit because many of these towns have grown as suburbs, not as complete towns. Uh, and that was in Costa Rica. This is in Honduras, but it's a similar case as well. And out in the suburbs, which is um, where most people live today, uh, we're trying to reintroduce the idea of the grid and uh, public space, courtyard buildings at different scales. And this project probably is more informed by the Brazilian tradition and follows the topography, um, reintroduces the traditions to a Caribbean island of the coast of Honduras. So it uses different building types that relate probably more to this climate and, this, and the traditions over there. And we've been also trying to reintroduce this idea as part of an educational effort and working with local entities or international entities to teach these ideas to, this is a, a forum for mayors, for Central American mayors and Caribbean mayors. And we've also written a book about urban design 
on how to apply these ideas to today. Um, and we're, we've also done coding for small towns, uh, many of them that follow the same law of the Indies principles. It's trying to extract the, the DNA of those places and create a new regulations that are able to keep the character in place and create more organized places. Andrew, want to add something for this? Yeah. Um, before Maria starts. I, I wanted to, to introduce Maria Mercer. So, Maria. As you mentioned before, Maria Mercer is from Dwayne Platers Ibrick and Company. Thank you, Andrew and Eduardo. It was great. Um, I think we can um, uh, say that we learned a lot. And it's important to realize that we have to appreciate our history and to learn from it, but not negate it. Uh, we have known of the situation and uh, the new urban development situation in our countries, especially uh, south of the border, south of uh, the equator, and the dramatic changes that we have uh, faced in the last uh, decades. So I'm jumping um, in history a little bit. Uh, we had a lot of, you know, the historical things and they brought us to what it's happening today and how new, the new urbanism is trying to uh, uh, improve the situation of the conventional suburban development being uh, uh, produced in our countries. And I go back a little bit into uh, a new, even a newer tradition in, in Brazil, which was the modern, uh, modernist urbanism uh, introduced by uh, planners um, Lucio Costa and uh, Oscar Niemeyer. They were inspired by Le Corbusier with the um, modern uh, towns that were uh, very dictated by their function. And especially Brasilia had an important monumental scale, as we can see on the on this picture where we have these uh, warriors um, uh, sculptures that are incredibly tall. And we have to think that per perhaps Brasilia was designed for them. And it was really uh, a, a problem in, in design scale where the city has grown uh, twice the size as it should be. So it was definitely designed uh, for the car uh, where the pedestrian feels uh, neglected. And it has created spaces like this um, this is the uh, pilot project, the, the aerial photograph of the pilot project, and you can see it's in the shape of a plane. It, it has, you know, this sort of idiosyncratic um, ideas, and this is another uh, shape that you could probably relate. Um, so one of the things that occurred in Brasilia, and, and this is a, an incredibly different pattern that we have seen so far in this lecture today, and it created the, what we call the superblocks, uh, which are these uh, larger structures, but you don't really see a lot of permeability through. So there is not really a grid like the lay uh, of the Indies, of the Indies, but it, Brazil is fairly uh, flat, so you wouldn't have the organic pattern of of the historical towns in Brazil either. So what came uh, to happen was this crazy hybrid of, of modern urbanism. Uh, the, the blocks are very large and ha they have about uh, 300, uh, 900 feet, so 300 meters uh, by 300 meters. And we see that the, the, you know, there's not a, a lot of permeability. The mobility is definitely uh, completely uh, car oriented. And some of these internal streets were actually reversed because they were uh, des designated to handle the commercial areas for the neighborhood uh, and, and try to, to, to work the smaller uh, scale uh, neighborhood as a more compact uh, place in, in, uh, opposed to the monumental areas of the, the ministries and the, uh, uh, the civic spaces of the government, uh, though they had to reverse because people weren't really walking to shop. So there's not much uh, walkable urbanism happening because the, the conditions of the, the space are not very friendly to, to people to walk on the streets. Uh, we can see here the incredible uh, uh, 
monumental scale of, of the town and as a retrofitter, uh, I would love to w come, come one day and infill this entire, uh, uh, you know, esplanade with uh, urban blocks. I think it would uh, turn out to be a great thing. So you see that there is no scale whatsoever, not for the car, uh, much less for the pedestrian. It doesn't really create a sense of place, and it doesn't create the, the you know, places that we really love and places that we visit. Um, and, and the dimensions and the design uh, have a lot to do with that. So then I will move a little bit to other traditional cities uh, in Brazil. And this is uh, a photograph of Curitiba. It's my hometown. Uh, so I'll probably be very biased towards it. Uh, and I think that uh, Curitiba is one of the cities that do show um, a great mix of, the, of urban components. It has the incredible uh, na the neighborhood structure that we see, and it has a town center, a very uh, mixed town center. So we can see through the um, area photograph, you know, it's a very a connected city, and you see the, the neighborhoods and, and the town center with a lot more, more density on this slide, and you know, a lot more green and, and residential scale neighborhoods on the other slide. Um, another thing that is very famous about Curitiba that could probably um, say that put us in the world map was the uh, BRT system. It's called the uh, tra trans Integrated uh, Transit Network. It's um, RIT in Portuguese most uh, known as BRT is for uh, bus rapid transit. And the interesting uh, image on, on, on this map is that the reds are actually the ciclovia system or the bike path system that connect parks through pathways uh, very well distributed throughout the, entire system, throughout the entire city in addition to a very efficient bus system. So the city grew, it's a very compact town in terms of area, but is incredibly dense. It has about two million inhabitants. So it, you know, it has, you can see in blue, perhaps not much because the map is quite small, but there, it's a city that has lots of, of rivers and valleys. So we have, uh, we have been able to um, keep many of those green areas as parks. So it indeed created a, a beautiful system of, of greenways, paths, parks, and, and transit. And these are the components that need to be part of, of a good, uh, a, a well-planned city. And then we jump to yet another dramatic uh, uh, issue, which is Sao Paulo and, and the metropolis. So we have been, in urbanism, we discuss uh, the places in, in various scales, you know, the region, the city, the block, the community, and the building. And here uh, you have uh, this uh, amazing view of the Sao Paulo skyline, and, and it's a metropolis, and it has to be looked at as such with all the, the problems and, and, and the issues. But also, it, it is an incredible uh, hub of activity. It's, it's uh, culturally very rich and, and also financially very rich is our financial uh, capital of the, of the country. Uh, uh, interestingly, Sao Paulo had also plans. It had been developed uh, and, and planned, including this uh, map on the right, which is the, the areas of Jardins. It was designed by Barry Parker, and Jardins uh, means garden. So these are the, a garden, it, this is part of the Garden City uh, movement uh, where they designed the, the neighborhood. And the photo on the other side, you see that the tsunami of towers was not able to take over um, the neighborhood because of a paper. It is legally, um, it's prohibited uh, through a document that to uh, grow or rebuild in the, in the neighborhood of Jardins. So I think, you know, we, we have to, to think the, of the fact that regulations uh, still have a great responsibility in keeping our cities uh, controlled and, and well organized. And unfortunately, I will have to, sh you know, share the, the, the news that uh, suburban sprawl is not a privilege of America. It has affected many of our countries in, in, in South America. And I would like to show in the in the future slides uh, the ways that we have been thinking on, on how to, to, to 
provide better ways of, of planning. So this doesn't have a place. I'm not saying where this is. It doesn't really matter because it happens everywhere in the country, from the Northeast to the South and, and Midwest. Uh, so this is not really the point. It's just to show that the city is really uh, sprawling towers, the suburbs, and, and it's becoming a, an incredible green uh, patchwork. And um, one of the biggest issues we have in, in South America as well is security. So people are fleeing from the big cities where they don't feel safe anymore, even though the cities are absolutely urban and, and, and rich and, and, and diverse, but people uh, feel the necessity to move out of the city to the exurbs uh, in, in search for, for a safe haven. And unfortunately, they're coming with a, a huge price tag. Uh, we see, we keep seeing the, the patchwork again, but now they're done through gated communities. And you can, uh, in, the, in a map, you would probably see that, well, this looks like a, a city, but it, it isn't. These are individual pods, and you're not allowed to go from one to the next if you're not a resident. So it's creating huge, uh, residential pockets, which are absolutely segregated. This is a different one. This is one in construction right now. So what's happening is really alarming and in a, at an alarming scale. Uh, Brazil is a very big country. Things are moving fast and we're scared. So um, we now start to be able to get comparisons like we do as, um, as planners uh, but especially in America, America is very uh, generous in providing us uh, examples of, of conventional suburbia and uh, traditional uh, neighborhood development. So this is in Campinas and you can see the city has um, a good mix of housing and civic spaces and density and is a connected, well-balanced uh, uh, town. However, there is a huge tendency of the suburban uh, place being built, which is separating the residential use, the commercial use, the office, the district, all of them uh, feeded by, uh, fed by, by an incredible system of highways, which are taking many, many hours of people's lives uh, through commute. So this is the first project that um, DPZ done, uh, did in Brazil uh, over 10 years ago. And it's to show that we also have to be very sensitive of the contextual scale of the context of the place to be very culturally sensitive when, when designing for a new, uh, a new town. And this uh, example shows specifically the question of security. How are we going to handle security when the only thing people care about is to be within gates or a walled community? So this image here. Um, shows a little bit of the technique that we, uh, we used. And this project is actually uh, being implemented right now. Um, it has been updated. It doesn't look like the, the, the next photo that I'm going to show, which is the master plan. Uh, and over the course of, of 10 years, development has changed dramatically. So when this project was designed, uh, there wasn't a lot of development going on uh, in the country, and people really reacted to having a complete new town being uh, developed in a greenfield. So b b besides the hurdles of approvals and, and the reaction of the NIMBYs, which also happened in Brazil, uh, I think the, pro the project was able to evolve and, and, and be more uh, competitive and, and, and um, compatible to the reality of today. So you can see that there is a crust of um, a tighter fabric of houses, so buildings are uh, either touching each other, either attached or in, in smaller lots, uh, forming some sort of a crust that will uh, protect the interior lots, which, are, which tend to be larger. So by providing a variety of sizes of lots and variety of housing, you also provide a more secured unit that you can develop, and it has a um, permeability and connectivity, though it could be secured. What we didn't want to, to, to do was to allow the plan to be absolutely mandated you know, um, through automated systems, because this is one of the things that people really care about, and the market is driven to automated systems. So how do you access your neighborhood if you don't have a gate? So it was designed to accommodate the, the need, but not driven by it. 
So this is the overall master plan. It, has, it doesn't look like this today. It has been um, updated. And uh, we can still see that there, you know, uh, the, the neighborhood, neighborhood structure is, is visible. There is a town center. So even in creating a new development, we need to think of how to uh, use and employ the best practices of, of, of urbanism that we see in traditional planning. Uh, so moving to another part of the country, also in terms of security, um, we tend to look at the city and pay attention to the best qualities of the town because the projects needs, need to be very contextualized. Uh, the market and, and the people will not appreciate a, a town that it's imposed on them if they don't uh, fit, fit in very well with their own traditions. So these are some studies that we have, um, we have done to create you know, security. So this um, might look like a fortress because of, of the color, but this would be uh, buildings or a higher intensity use or perhaps attached uh, buildings creating the, you know, the protection uh, surrounding an internal grid of, of blocks and lots still with you know, green spaces, civic opportunity, and the opportunity to, to be connected uh, when situation uh, gets better in the country. So here are some models. And um, this, I, show, I like showing this slide because I think there are many ways that designers can provide uh, uh, solutions with, with creativity and not just use the single uh, element of the wall surrounding an entire community. So this is the outcome of the project. Uh, it doesn't, you, you can see that there's a wall, you, can't, you don't see that, you know, that this is a fortress or a gated community, but a very well-balanced neighborhood with you know, uh, houses, bigger, smaller, uh, squares, uh, internal spaces that could be within a secured uh, smaller unit of, of residential use, although there is a mix and all the components of, 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 the, of good urbanism. And also because we have over 8,000 miles, 8,000 kilometers of coast, I'd like to share a, a resort project that uh, we, we created. And these images show a comparison between a, a very loved place, which is Praia do Forte in the northeast of Brazil, and it has its uh, traditional, uh, authentic uh, town design, in contrast with a very suburban resort plan. So this is absolutely a, the most loving and successful uh, place in comparison to a very ill-designed project that doesn't even deal with seasonality. And a very interesting uh, thing of this place was that it was the first one that allowed us to create the Brazilian transect. So by now you're probably more familiar with the transect, which is you know, the, the, the guiding tool that, uh, that we use in our, all our plans. And in this in the middle is the Hawaiian Ahupua'a, which is the Hawaiian transit that goes from the mountain to the sea. This is the urban transit that goes from uh, natural, this is perhaps the, the human transit, transit uh, that goes from natural to, to urban. And this is the coastal transit in Brazil showing the different um, types of, uh, of, of nature in a natural environment. And this goes back to the origin of the transit actually uh, when we did a, when we studied the cross section through nature, which led us to create the urban transect. So this is the outcome of, of of the place, and I would like to show you the regulating plan for this because it shows the the approach of of creating a pro, uh, a place that is more integrated with its site. Um, in this area here, we have. Um, uh, do, uh, dunes, and it's a very sensitive area where we uh, dedicated a very light imprint uh, use with larger lots, and uh, it's a very uh, rural uh, condition where uh, the sand pads are going to be uh, capped. And as you come uh, towards the center, you can see that there is also a transect that comes from the, these, you know, uh, more natural areas towers, the more intense areas, and this is where the main street is, is, um, happens with, with the action of, of the beach resort. So it's a very large town 
uh, we created also an additional town center for, for the city that connects uh, north-south. Uh, and this is the BR-101, uh, which is the, the main highway that connects the, the country from north to south. And this is a detail of the codes. Um, as uh, Andrew and Eduardo were showing earlier, I think uh, the urban codes, urban and architectural codes, are documents that are very important to accompany each design because they will regulate and make sure that everything is in place and allocated um, to, to create a very balanced, diverse, and, and successful uh, place. Uh, we see here that we have a part of a district that could be a hotel, uh, and, and there's a lot of, of green areas that have been preserved, uh, some uh, civic areas that are also structured to be like that. And this is, um, you know, the, the watercolor that shows the, the outcome of it. Uh, there is the main layer, of the first layer of the town that has been, uh, that will be restored. As we know and are very uh, aware of uh, climate change condition, we know that the sea level rise uh, might impact entire coastal towns. So we need to, to be aware and, and make sure that we provide enough room uh, to create a coastal town and, and later uh, not see it disappear. And this is just another uh, illustration to show uh, the condition that we can use several types of, 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 building, of buildings and, and, and design uh, to allocate uh, uses where there is more sensitivity in, in the site. And um, I'm coming towards the end uh, and I'm showing with this last um, uh, project a, uh, the approach to higher density. Uh, in comparison to America, our cities are growing to be a lot more dense, in, in Brazil especially. Of course, that many countries in, in South America are facing the same challenge to accommodate uh, popula uh, population growth. So this is an infill project. Um, that, that has a funny L-shaped uh, site. And the status quo of development in the town was to employ the maximum development capacity that the site will, will, would allow you, as shown by the neighbors, which is creating a tall tower on top of a podium uh, and provides no urbanism whatsoever. So the city is just being uh, uh, filled with uh, buildings that are very tall and completely sat back and there's no uh, attention to the facade or the public realm uh, and interaction with the private realm. So what we did was to try to get all that mass that we had, all that you know, amount of, of square footage that we were allowed and, and through a creative way trying to you know, play with the mass and, and provide a piece of urbanism inside even if it's a smaller site than a block. Um, so this is how it looks like, and uh, it will hopefully look like soon. And uh, the interesting thing to uh, observe in this slide is that in the ground, we call it the pedestrian scale of urbanism. Uh, and uh, in the towers, it's the real estate and development. So it is a, a, a double um, use urbanism that we, we need to think about and how to provide realm for, the, for, for humans. And, and to be pedestrian friendly, this happens to be a pedestrian walk, a, a paseo that uh, cuts the block, providing uses, shops, restaurants, a movie theater, and up above you'll have the uh, residential uh, apartments that are needed to accommodate the incredible uh, deficit in housing in, in the country. So in contrast to many projects that we see that ne neglect, completely neglect the street, uh, we would like to see that there is an alternative and th through design to create better places. And, and this is just a similar project uh, where we emphasize the, the, the need for this dual urbanism, which is, you know, uh, I'm repeating again, just, you know, uh, because I like to think about it. And this is the pedestrian realm where people shop and the streets are, are uh, friendly and even it's car friendly, why not? You know, we accommodate parking. Uh, there is a clever way of, of, of accommodating the, the needs of, of a project without having to be limited through a very uh, 
by a very uh, obsolete zoning code. So, uh, and this is the, the development part of it where we need to make the project work and to provide real estate as well. So the last uh, thing I'd like to mention is that this, is, this might be the face of the new world. Uh, we haven't uh, collectively been thinking about uh, incredible amounts of density and, and intensity, and many of us think that towers aren't sustainable uh, building types. Uh, they're just suckers of energy, and uh, I think that it needs to be contextually analyzed because this is the reality of South America and Latin America and, and how we can uh, still create uh, good places for people without having to just uh, you know, think about the obsolete zoning codes that only allow towers to be built on, on podiums that are absolutely car friendly and obsessed creating a, you know, a negative impact in our cities. So, you know, it, it, it goes to the high altitudes, but I think it's also good for people. So uh, I'd like to close with that. And uh, I'd like to thank Andrew and, and, and Eduardo for the great talk. And to wrap up saying that we had an incredible beginning with all these traditions in, in uh, colonial architecture, uh, both Hispanic tradition and the Luso Brazilian tradition, and that today we have to look at our own traditions of modern architecture and um, you know, try to uh, bring back a little bit of the traditional uh, urban design that we use in, in planning and, and apply to make places that people will love and will last for, for long. So thank you. I'll take questions. Thank you. <laughs> okay, um, we can take questions if anyone uh, wants to come up, or we have microphones. So I don't know, we, whatever you. Or just shout out, shout out. <laughs> or you can shout <laughs> to be a more flexible uh, conversation. Ask in whatever language you want. <laughs> we can translate. Yes, three: <laughs> Portuguese, uh, English, and Spanish. Perhaps Italian, Greek, yeah. a little bit. Yeah. Yes. How common is that type of retail in Brazil that's more integrated in the urban fabric and open to everyone basically? Is that becoming more common now or is it usually limited to a close form? Well, I, I hate to think that this is a novelty, you know, to have uh, shops on the street because you can see in many cities in Brazil is a very, very urban country. We're actually importing the method, you know, of, of enclosed communities from elsewhere, perhaps here. So uh, it's not that it's a, a weird uh, thing that we have been creating, but also a model that people uh, know and recognize. Uh, so it has been um, implemented in, in several projects. Uh, th we think that the mixed use is an absolute must in each uh, project, uh, depending on the, on the scale because it does guarantee the ability to walk to places to when you mix a certain balance of, of, of uh, uses, residential office and, and, and commercial. So uh, this is something that definitely will be implemented in the future and we uh, hope that it will be embraced because it's only uh, natural to see places that have shops on the street and I could show you tons of photographs and you would r recognize. I mean, one of the uh, most interesting cities in, in Sao Paulo is called uh, Oscar Freire and it's, it has been renovated. It has white sidewalks. The shops are very successful. Um, it has big men wearing black in the front to ensure the perception of security for the shoppers. Nonetheless, every time I go to Sao Paulo, I feel safe. I feel much safer in Sao Paulo than perhaps in certain neighborhoods in Miami. Much safer than walking across the Raul Boulevard, if you allow me, <laughs> we're in Florida. So yeah, this is a, a matter of perception and a matter, a matter of, of market. I think it's going to be a model that people will, um, will uh, support. 
Just to add, to add to that a little bit, it also goes back to the regulations. Uh, sometimes in Latin America you see towers uh, surrounded by walls on the first floor in very urban areas, which is probably the extreme of trying to, take, to make something secure. But if uh, the regulation does away with that wall, make, you know, you can actually promote mixed use again and instead of walking down the street with a lot of blank walls. Um, and the other thing, about, especially about the images you were showing about the retail, is that pedestrian streets work in Latin America when perhaps here in the U.S. they have trialed and failed many times. Yeah. Well, there's, there's one key thing that perhaps could be a big difference uh, when we talk about pedestrian uh, streets is that you have the, the population density. People are on the streets all the time. When you build, you know, 20-story 20 20 to 20 buildings that are mid-rises, you know, because we have much taller buildings in, in South America and in many of the, you know, most urban or bigger cities, uh, capital cities. So you do have that in your advantage. You already have your shoppers right there. You know, they just descend through the elevator, so you don't really have a lot of work to attract people, they're already there. So this is one thing that is to the advantage of, of the commercial in pedestrian, pedestrian streets as well. Yes. Hi, Mari. I think transit is absolute key. Uh, I have to admit, uh, and Curitiba with their great famous BRT system is now absolutely clogged with traffic. It's a, uh, you know, a tragedy that has come upon my hometown uh, because people do, do not feel comfortable uh, riding buses all the time, but also because the system has already reached its, its peak and there's a lack of investment in, um, in, in transit, and it's a cultural problem that needs to be addressed. I think that once there is enough transit that it's comfortable, reliable, and inexpensive, people will uh, choose to, to ride it. And um, uh, there's also big pressure from the car industry, which is very, very strong in Brazil. So we can see some similarities to, to the U.S. where the, the car is a big uh, economic weapon also. So there needs to have a balance to make sure that the cars are not going to be taken over the cities because it's creating a, a huge nightmare and, and just not economical nightmare, but you know, environmental and, and people's lives or quality of lives are, are decreasing. Uh, but I don't think that the the, the question of, of transit is directly related to security. Uh, people do take the, the transit if they need to, but they're, they're not just not, not going to take bus because I'm going to be robbed inside of the bus. There's different, uh, uh, security has different, has taken a different uh, approach and I am biased to, to think that it has become a big market um, uh, challenge because people demand to be buying in, in you know, projects or de developments that have a gate in the front. And this is the single most uh, method of selling real estate in Brazil these days is to show the guardhouse. I mean, you don't show the place. It doesn't matter if the lot is beautiful, if the, the, there is nature. You do see happy people in the real estate marketing material and you see the gate, and, but how you get that, it's, it's really beyond their uh, perception. So creating places, it's going to be a challenge because 
but it will be successful once the security is, is uh, addressed. And I think that there are so many uh, strategies that can be employed in providing uh, not only the automated security, but also the perception of security in these places. Yeah, and on that note, I, I, I do believe, and um, we'll, we've seen it, uh, we've seen an evolution of or, uh, uh, urban design projects uh, in the last few years in Central America. Um, but I believe that good urban design is the key for, uh, you know, for, for, for working with the security. Um, you, have, you have to have good urban design. You, and people have to, you have to provide a design so that people can walk out to the streets again. You have to make them nice and safe to walk on. Um, it's, it's a challenge, but you can see it in, in the first uh, New Urbanism Inspired projects in Guatemala, you have the large condominiums uh, lined by, by habitable space, uh, you know, different building types, apartment buildings and all that. And now you can see security being dealt with at the block level, um, and it's starting to work. So if you create a better public realm, I think we can deal with the security issue, I mean, slowly. It's, it's also, in many cases, it's a matter of perception as well, that the public is already, you know, very fearful of being out in the public realm. Yeah, people, mm -hmm. yeah, it, it has become an addiction. And, and with the security issue, there are a lot of places where Brazil is making uh, ex extreme advancements in, in improving security. I remember in, in, in Rio in the 1990s, there were places where, where my family, my, my relatives would prohibit me to walk, and then other places where we wouldn't stop at the red lights. You know, we just sort of come to a rolling stop and keep going through the red light because, you know, you never know what could happen at the intersection. And those same places right now um, have started to transform and, and are bright spots in the city where you see sidewalk cafes coming back. And, and, and so the, 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 the thing is that the, the whole resilience of the city and how it's coming back from sometimes terrible despair is, is, is pretty astonishing and it's pretty encouraging. Yeah. One other thing is that regarding the transit, uh, Rio and a few other cities are, are, are making extraordinary leaps in their, in their urban transit systems. I mean, they're burrowing through granite mountains that are, you know, uh, the hardest rock you can imagine. And they're going underwater and over water, and they're building their subway systems out. So whenever you hear some engineer in Florida say that you can't build a subway, you know, just remember that they're doing so, and they started that with limited economic means because Brazil's economic boom wasn't always the case. I mean, they were already planning and constructing a pretty advanced subway system in some of those cities when things were not looking so bright, you know, in the 80s and the 90s. So that's just uh, a lesson for us, I think, who, yes? I think uh, I, I don't want I don't want to you know Maria is the the real Brazilian here I'm just you know someone new. but um, <laughs> you're just a third <laughs> I'm just a pretender the uh, the uh, but I think that at least observing observing the parts of the country that I know I think that Brazilians have um, have have they never fled the city to the extent that Americans did and I think a lot of them continued to live the urban experience to a much greater extent. And um, so I think to a large swath of the population who have just continued live, living a, a, a satisfying and, and, and high quality of life in great metropolitan centers, I think they, they get it. So um, now, of course, there is always room for improvement, but I think that there's not that sort of, it, it, it's, it would be, if we were to translate that book, it would have to be a little bit of an adjustment to what the market is because you know, here we had to say, a whole generation has forgotten what a city was like. There it's not the same. So. I think it, uh, it's, it's baby steps both ways. Uh, we haven't gone far enough to suburbia to, ha to have created, you know, the situation that we've seen in, in the U.S. 
but we haven't also incorporated, you know, this, this passion for developing, you know, great urban towns. So it's, it, it's still um, adapting itself to, you know, incorporating new ideas, but, uh, you know, having the, the thought that uh, going back to, to what the U.S. Um, has faced is, is, is being uh, in, in their heads in terms of awareness. Uh, of course, that I think um, that translating all the books, it, it will have to, to, hap to happen. We need to, to bring more awareness of, of the things that are happening elsewhere uh, to really f fight the conditions that uh, we see that are you know, developing uh, more and more in Brazil. And um, we have many Brazilians in the room, and I think if they wanted to pitch in and give their opinion of, of, of how their lives are being affected, if uh, you know, they appreciate their urban centers, and I usually say that I was born and raised in a high-rise, so uh, I think the urbanism is really embedded in the culture, and the new model that we see these days, which is the sprawling suburbs, is, is the, the change, but it's not the change for the better, it's, it's the change for something that hasn't been tested in Brazil, but we, we know that it has been tested in here, and the, it, the cultural differences are not going to impact as much uh, in, this, in this case, because we all know that you know, the, the human being hasn't changed in terms of, of, of physical uh, composition, so the commute is miserable as well. You know, the, having, not knowing your neighbors is the same thing. Having to depend and pay a lot of money for security uh, is, is also uh, alarming. So there's many uh, comparisons that can be done, and I think that you know, the great urban places will need to be designed in, in lieu of the sprawling suburbia that's happening. Yeah. Yeah, that's very true. It's a very interesting aspect of the of the status. You see, your that you live in a gated community. It's because you're you're doing well. Uh, though, even if Walmart is is building neighborhood markets, we know that they always need to adapt and change because uh, we uh, need changes in, in the market, changes in reality. So other options will, will need to be envisioned. It's not just the gate that will make people happy living you know, within a secured uh, neighborhood. Um, at some point, the demand will, will grow towards uh, better conditions. They will demand better quality of, of, of public spaces. And, and not to be isolated within a res, uh, residential pod. So all these, these things that um, uh, we know that have failed in America are a big wake-up call to, to the awareness of things that should, come, you know, should not come, perhaps, <laughs> their way. So. And did you still have a question also? Yes.
we had actually proposed a, a full day session that would, <laughs> that this, this was actually just one piece of the puzzle. We wanted to talk about all of that. So you're, you're absolutely right. That's, that's something that really needs to be discussed and, and, and that's the ultimate organic, free form, intricate settlement, right? And there's so much that could be said on the topic. I, um, you know, uh, it, maybe we could just have a conversation afterwards and, and, you know, and propose maybe for a future CNU, but, um, it's, it's a really, it's a, it's, it's really the next frontier because, um, it's, uh, we have to address it and we have to learn from, uh, everybody else too in the South, uh, and approach that subject with a lot of humility. Yeah. Actually, we're running out of time, so I just wanted to say that uh, this is the New World uh, Congress, and we do appreciate the fact that we have a session especially on our new part of the world, that we're now looking at the map uh, upside down. Uh, so, uh, you know, changing the focus a little bit from the Northern Hemisphere. So we uh, like to, to see more people from other countries and, and make the CNU very international. So, you know, pledge to your international friends to, to come join us uh, next year in, in Salt Lake City. And perhaps we can have uh, a CNU, you know, Latin America sometime, uh, somewhere, perhaps in, in Brazil or Guatemala or uh, any other uh, country, so we could start doing more international um, work as well. So we can brainwash the whole world, essentially. <laughs>